So I'm pretty lucky. I get to travel quite a bit. I get to travel to some of the greatest cities in the world. One thing I notice every time I travel to these cities is that they seem to be getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And actually, by 2050, the global population is going to reach 9 billion people. Now, that's 2 billion more people on the Earth than there are today. And so these cities are actually growing upward and outward to accommodate businesses and homeowners. And these sprawling cityscapes have a lot more people living in them. They need a lot more land for construction. And those people need a greater sources of food production. And so by 2050, the same year that we'll have 9 billion people living on the planet, we'll also need to increase our food production by 60%. Now, land for agricultural use is actually depleting, and it's depleting quickly. And so it's becoming increasingly difficult to source natural, raw, sustainable food. And by the end of the century, the average global sea level is going to rise 7 to 23 inches. Now, 7 to 23 doesn't sound like a huge number, but if we consider the fact that half of the world's population actually live within 37 miles of the sea, and three-quarters of the world's largest cities are located along coastal regions, according to the United Nations, it's a pretty significant number. And sea levels actually on the east coast of the United States rise three to four times faster according to the United Nations, than anywhere else in the world. And considering the latest political move to withdraw the United States from the Paris Agreement, that's a little bit worrisome. But unfortunately, the meat and dairy industries are one of the biggest drivers of pollution and climate change. And as countries like China begin to adopt a more westernized diet and their cities grow large, the demand for meat increases. And so that puts an even bigger strain on our environment in a world driven by capitalism, our lives and environments, such as the cities that we live in, force us to consider convenience, and convenience in the shape of this, highly processed fast food. Now, we all hear about it, we know about it, we're told about it, we read about it, that processed food like this can contribute to higher risks of type 2 diabetes, heart disease, obesity. And what's even scarier is the fact the traces of additives and toxins that are found in cleaning agents are often detected in food like this. Now, we're eating that and we're putting it into our bodies and out into the environment. And so what I'm trying to say to everybody is that we need a more sustainable solution to help feed the world. For us living in Western society, we're not just faced with these wicked problems, right? Wicked problems being population overgrowth, pollution and climate change, poor health and well-being, we're actively contributing to that. And so we need smarter, better ways to produce food. Quick show of hands, who here grew up on a farm? Can I see a couple of people? Not that many, okay. Well, I didn't, I didn't grow up on a farm, but my uncle was a farmer, and so I spent a lot of my childhood um, on a farm, pretending to be a farmer. I'm from Tullamore, County Offaly, in the middle of Ireland. Um, it's home to Tullamore Dew Whiskey and Tullamore Agricultural Show. And the agricultural show is held once a year, and it brings thousands of people together for one day. Uh, it brings farmers and their livestock together for a day of livestock trading, exhibitions, and competitions. And so the agricultural sector is something I've been exposed to all my life. Uh, I totally understand the importance of its importance of the sector to our culture and heritage here in Ireland, but actually to everywhere else in the world. Um, I'm pretty sure it's also a sin to sit down at a dinner table in an Irish household without like the leg or the rind or belly of some animal. Um, pretty sure that is a sin. But um, if we actually zoom out of that, zoom out of what we know today, Traditional livestock around the world occupy 70% of all farmlands. And considering our earlier points about meat and dairy industries being one of the biggest drivers of pollution, and that agricultural land is depleting, that's bloody terrifying. And so, four years ago, while I was studying design at the Institute of Art, Design and Technology, IADT, just south of Dublin, um, I kind of set out to discover, through design, um, a more sustainable solution or better, better um, 
answer to these wicked problems, right, these big global issues in relation to food. And I stumbled across what I thought at the time was an unlikely alternative to conventional meat, conventional meat being beef, pork, chicken. What I stumbled across was this guy. Now, yes, this is a cricket, it's an insect, um, and I heard a couple of little uh, murmurs here to my right, and you're probably thinking something that I thought at the time. Uh, no, thank you, I'd rather not eat this. Thank you very much. Um, when I learned about the term entomophagy, which is the practice of eating insects, uh, I absolutely did not want to sit down to a plate of crickets or worm, uh, and I didn't know anybody uh, who wanted to do that either. But considering all of these looming issues, these big problems, I was really intrigued, and so I continued my research. And in the same year that I started my project, 2013, the Food and Agricultural Organization published this report. This report ent entitled Edible Insects set out to assess the viability of insects as a means to end world hunger. And surprisingly to me, when I read this report, three facts reveal themselves. One, edible insects actually sustain and improve many local diets around the world because of the high nutritional value of many of the species. Western society, us, we're not totally averse to eating insects, while they're not readily available in the local supermarket just yet. Um, they are accessible. And finally, edible insects provide business opportunities in the mini livestock sector, and so they encourage and promote economic growth. And if we look even closer at insects, we can learn that they convert organic waste, such as leaves, vegetables, fruit pulp, into edible protein for human consumption. They also require far less utilities for production, such as electricity, water, land usage, than traditional livestock, such as cattle. They also release less greenhouse gases. So for one pound of protein from, say, mealworm, it has a greenhouse gas footprint 1% as large as protein from cattle. And finally, insects like grasshoppers, crickets, mealworm, very high in protein, but also high in iron and calcium, very low in fats and saturated fats, and so they're healthy for you. But facts are facts, and while facts can be convincing, you're probably wondering, well, who actually eats these, right? Um, if you get to travel, or if you have traveled to places in China, Thailand, South America, Mexico, uh, you'll see street vendors frying, roasting, selling crickets, grasshoppers, locusts, mealworm, tarantulas, scorpions even. And they don't do that out of novelty, and they don't do it because it's the only food they have. They do it because edible insects provide over two billion people around the world with the nutrients they need as part of their daily diet. And they ha that's the case for over thousands of years. And so for me to truly understand the value and the benefits of eating insects, I had to try it myself. And so I started to cook with insects, I started to eat them, and I started to share them out with my friends and family. And here's some examples of, of some recipes that I, I uh, made at the beginning of this research, a few years ago, right? So we've got an egg omelette with weaver ants, and stir fry with sago worm. And something really funny happened to me. You know, my initial reaction, this kind of fearfulness, quickly disappeared, and that shock value completely waned as I started to explore and experiment with this food, and I started to eat it. And so I started to think, well, how do I scale that out? How do I actually introduce that to my demographic, my community, uh, and other people in Western society, in a society where it's considered a taboo, a cultural taboo, to eat something like this? I mean, for many of us, creatures such as insects, they belong on the ground, right? They're, they're creatures of the earth, of dark, damp corners. And so I needed to break down those barriers. This was something that I heard when I started to introduce this concept to my tutors, my classmates, and my friends. When I see the whole body, then I just can't do it, right? And so our perception and you know, what we do, our reactions, they're psychologically driven. It's, it's very much a mind over matter situation when it comes to eating insects. And so, I was curious about this. How do we actually overcome our kind of fears? The visual component is so compelling. Actually seeing the insect was so powerful, but not in a very positive way as far as I was concerned. And so I continued to experiment, right? I continued to explore, but in new forms. And this time, 
there were no squirms or quivers this side of the audience or anywhere else. Uh, this time, I started to explore in this form. And remember that cricket I showed you at the beginning? That's essentially him ground down into a spoonful of cricket powder, cricket protein powder. And protein, it's an essential compound of our diet. We all, we all need to eat protein. And this is an alternative to conventional meat, such as pro uh, pork, beef, chicken. And we get this out of crickets. Pound for pound, gram for gram, crickets and other insects actually provide similar, sometimes more, protein and natural protein than what we're, we're eating currently. And so I started to bake with it. I started to make things like bread. This is an oat and walnut bread. And I was really surprised by the versatility and the accessibility of cricket powder. It has a sort of nutty, chocolatey aroma and flavor. And it's a, it acts as a substitute or an additive of protein. Energy bites, one of my favorite things to make. Purely raw, natural ingredients, fruit, nut, cricket powder, high in protein, really big hit at events and with friends. Uh, and so I started to note a change in reaction to people who I was presenting uh, this to. And people were saying, well, why wouldn't I eat this? It's delicious and healthy. And so I would present the usual facts, I would tell my story as I've told it today around why it's logical to consider insects as a new food for us in Western society. But when I presented it as something familiar, that something that people maybe see in the health food store or the local supermarket, then it wasn't so difficult and it was easier to communicate. People got it, they understood and they wanted more. And so there's a movement happening across Europe and across America where startups in the food innovation industry are actually selling, they're, they're producing edible insect goods and treats, energy bars, pasta, and other products, all in an effort to convince us to introduce insects to our daily diet. Alex Atala, he's the head chef of Dom in Sao Paulo, a fine dining restaurant. He actually features one of his dishes that has ants in it, in one of his episodes on Chef's Table on Netflix. Noma, Michelin star restaurant in Denmark, they're renowned for their research in entomophagy, right? So again, the practice of eating insects. You'll often find insects on their, their menu. And so if we take a second to consider that, take a second to think about where we are as a global population, global society in relation to eating, eating bugs, we know that they're served up for hundreds of dollars to elite, curious, adventurous gourmands in fine dining restaurants around the world, Developing communities, edible insects provide them with the nutrients they need every single day, over two billion people. But here, Western society, for us, who are responsible for urban development, mass deforestation, pollution, industrialization, we have somehow fallen behind in adopting this, this food supply. Now, we have a responsibility to pay attention to these facts, and consider these alternatives. And the onus is on us to make a positive change. And so, if insects can convert organic waste into edible protein, require less utilities such as electricity, water, and land, reduce carbon emissions relative to traditional livestock, they're healthy, delicious, and fun, then why are we not doing it already? And so they're not only scientifically proven to provide us with the nutrients that we need, they also provide business opportunities in the food, innovation and development sector. And so they provide opportunities for rural and urban areas, communities all across the world. I actually believe that if we work together to overcome cultural taboos associated with eating insects, we could create a healthier society and a happier planet. And so on that note, I would like to welcome you all to join me at the break and try some edible insects for yourself. And I'd love to hear your feedback. Thank you very much.